Tonight, we are hosting a public lecture by Dr. James Tour from Rice University in Houston, Texas. James Tour earned his Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from Syracuse University, his PhD in synthetic organic and organometallic chemistry from Purdue University, and postdoctoral post training in synthetic organic chemistry at the University of Wisconsin at Stanford University. Oh, in Stanford and Stanford University, excuse me. After spending 11 years on the faculty of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the University of South Carolina, he joined the Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology at Rice University in 1999, where he is presently the T.T. and W.F. Chow Professor of Chemistry, Professor of Computer Science and Material Science, and Nanoengineering. Dr. Tour has over 680 research publications and over 130 patent families, and he's won numerous prestigious awards for his research accomplishments of which I will now list a few. Dr. Tour's paper on nanocars was the most highly accessed journal article of all American Chemical Society articles in 2005, and it was listed by Live Science as the second most influential paper in all of science in 2005. Dr. Tour is ranked as one of the top 10 scientists in the world over the past decade by a Thomas a Thomson Reuters Citations Per Publication Index Survey in 2009, and in the same year he was elected as a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In 2013, he was named Scientist of the Year by R&D Magazine. This year, based on the impact of his published work, Dr. Tour has ranked in the top 0.004% of the 7 million scientists who have published at least five papers in their careers. Tonight, Dr. Tor will be, make, will be talking to us about the mystery of the origin of life and what science can tell us about it. He will also discuss to what extent a scientific understanding of this topic fits with his Christian faith. Thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation here. And uh, I've spoken once before at Ohio State about, uh, about 25 years ago. And, uh, uh, and then I spoke this afternoon in the materials department and, and, and then in this. I want to start out by just showing you a picture of my family so you see I'm just a regular guy. Um, this is my wife, we've been married, Shireen, we've been married 37 years. Met uh, when, when I was an undergraduate at church, uh, met in church. Um, this is my oldest daughter, Ambreen. She lives in Jerusalem, Israel, and uh, she's a mediator between Palestinians and Israelis. She's lived there since uh, uh, 2006 full-time, but she studied several years there before that. And this is her husband, Philip, and uh, um, this is the, the next child, uh, Sabrina. She's an attorney in Houston, does corporate litigation. And then Josiah, he's a medical doctor. And Ben, he just finished up with, um, as an investment banker with J.P. Morgan, and now he's doing private equity with uh, Madison Dearborn in Chicago. And these are our two grandchildren, Umbreen and Phillips, uh, girls, and um, they're our little treasures. So we're just a regular family. Um, let me just show you a few different areas that we've been working on recently. Uh, some of the things that occupy my time during the day <clears throat> to show you that, that I'm a real scientist. I don't just write popular books about science. Uh, this is a, a topic called laser-induced graphene. This, we, we can turn any material now into graphene, any carbon material. So we convert the carbon atoms directly into graphene. Graphene is single atomic sheets of graphite. They're one atom thick, and it's the strongest material known at those dimensions. We can turn the carbohydrates, uh, carbohydrates of bread into graphene coconut into a supercapacitor. Uh, this is going to spawn at least five companies. This is uh, graphene nanoribbons. This is already commercialized. And uh, I'll show you in a minute what we can do with these. We, can sp we split carbon nanotubes, and that makes them into these graphene nanoribbons. Uh, this is uh, computer memory. It's transparent. It's two-terminal memory. And uh, uh, this is now a, a public company. And uh, um, so, so uh, that's already been commercialized. This is a, a project where we work on traumatic brain injury, which is the number one disabler of young adults, and stroke, which is the number one disabler of older adults. And um, it's also, also uh, uh, working toward dementia. And so that's another company that will probably start in Q1 of 2020. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, 
a scale up of graphene. Uh, this is called flash graphene. This is a huge area that just, uh, uh, we, we discovered this just about a little over a year ago. This is now a, a, a company that has recently started and we can make large quantities of graphene now very cheaply from any carbon source we can turn into, in, into graphene in bulk. Uh, we've learned how to take plastic waste and make it into a material that can adsorb CO2 and uh, uh, be able to trap CO2 from flue gas. This is graphene quantum dots. Graphene quantum dots, um, uh, when we started this work, they were $1 million per kilogram. We learned how to make it from coal, which is $100 per ton in one step. And so this is uh, now a company, uh, a public company, and it's used in high-end shoes and purses for putting ID tags in it that are fluorescent so that it's, it's very hard to, uh, uh, to mimic this. So it's for authentication to say that it's the real deal. Uh, this is graphene with carbon nanotubes growing out of it seamlessly. This has uh, been translated into battery electrodes. It's a battery company just about 30 miles outside of Houston. Uh, we work in this area of making 3D graphene structures. We can, this is a, a 3D printed graphene, all one sheet of graphene. And then we work in this area of nano cars, where these little cars, where they have these motors, you shine a light on them and the motor will spin at three million rotations per second and push that car along. And these are so small, you can park 30,000 of these across the diameter of a human hair. Uh, and and uh, so they're really small. And, and then we, we also take these motors and we put a peptide on them so we can target them to a specific cell type. And these will bind to then a specific cell. And then we turn them on and they drill holes in the cell and kill the cell. This is a bacterium. This is one of these super bacterium, this highly antibiotic resistant bacteria. These are, these are slated to kill 10 million people per year by the year 2050. So when you students are my age, 10 million people a year are going to die from these bacteria unless we figure out how to kill them. And you can see what these nanomachines do. They just drill right through the, the, the cell wall here. This is uh, uh, um, uh, one of the things. And then, then the, the nano ribbons that I was just talking about, this is where we, uh, this, this rat has had her, her spinal cord completely cut in two at C5 at the base of the neck, separated in two. Then we put one drop of 1% solution of graphene nano ribbons in polyethylene glycol at that gap stitch it back up, and two weeks later, this rat is walking again. And uh, so there, there's reasons for this. It's, it's neurons love to grow across the graphene. And this is now translated in, into a company that's working on, uh, uh, we're, we're putting, re refusing uh, uh, spinal cords, optic nerves to do whole eye transplant, and peripheral nerves. And this is after three weeks, scored a 19 out of 21 on a mobility scale, 21 being optimal. So we're trying to make the lame walk, the blind see, and the deaf hear. Okay, with that, let me get into this lecture. It's with intent, no god, gods, or intelligent designer will be mentioned. Science will be used to critique scientific research. I'm not going to introduce anything of an intelligent designer or god until the end, and, I, and I'll point that out when I'm done with this part of the technical lecture, because science is quite able to critique science. So this is a car. This is not all the parts of a car. A lot of it is already assembled, but it just shows that there are a lot of parts here. Now, could you put this back together? You have no directions. Could you put it back together? It'd be tough. You have no tools either. You could put it back. It's hard, it's hard to do this. Try, try taking a piston ring and inserting it without, without a compressor to do that. So, so um, it's, it's hard to do this, but if, even if you had it all in a place, and this is just a small number compared to the number of parts in a cell. But let's say it's not all together in one place. Now, note there are several different kinds of materials. You have some plastics, you have some fabrics, you have, you have aluminum, you have steel. So there, there's these different parts, these different types of materials that are segregated into different parts. Some people say, well, you know, you, you, you have all of Earth. Okay, so let's spread all of this over Earth. Now you have to find some of these and put them back together. So some are going to be at the bottom of, of, of the ocean. Some are going to be on the top of the Himalayas. And, and so you, you've got to find the parts. They're not all together for you because you have the whole Earth. And some people say, well, it's not just the Earth. You have the whole universe. OK, we'll spread it out throughout the whole universe. Can you put that car together? Parts are spread out all over. It's a hard problem, isn't it? 
It's hard to put together a car. And plus, you may have the piece, but now when you're waiting to find the other piece, these things rust out, so the parts don't stay around very long. Same problem in a cell, same problem. If you have parts of it, they're gonna go bad. They oxidize actually, actually quite rapidly and they become useless. So what is the origin of life? This is pre-biology. This is pre-biology. This is before there's any biology, there's no enzymes. It's just, just a prebiotic earth. All you have are very simple compounds, acetone, uh, 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 you'll have CO2, you'll have nitrogen, you'll, you'll have uh, ammonia, you'll have cyanide, very simple compounds. So this is a cell. Somehow we've got to figure out how to make a cell. That's the origin of life. You can have a eukaryotic cell or you could have a, you could have a bacterium. It doesn't matter. There's so many different parts in this thing. And you have lipid bilayers, you have all this superstructure and these substructures that form and then, and then fall back apart to form somewhere else in the cell. It's a huge, amazing machine that's alive. Many, many more parts than in a car. So molecules don't care about life. Organisms care about life. Chemistry, on the contrary, is utterly indifferent to life. Without a biologically derived entity acting on them, molecules have never been shown to evolve toward life. Never. Molecules have never been shown. People, even trying to make ordered molecules is very hard. Nobody has ever created life, ever. We'll go over that more. But molecules don't move toward life, never. All right, almost every chemical synthesis experiment in Origin of Life can be summarized by a protocol analogous to this. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna send me some email, oh, what about this? They can, trust me, it falls into this protocol. You purchase some chemicals in high purity from a chemical company. So remember, there's already a problem there you, because you'd have to have these chemicals already on early earth. So what they do is they buy the, the chemicals. They, they, buy, they, they, they buy these chemicals in high purity. They mix those chemicals together in water in high concentrations or in a specific order under some set of carefully devised conditions in a modern lab. They obtain a mixture of compounds that have a resemblance to one or more of the four basic, the, ba the basic four classes of chemicals needed for life, which are carbohydrates, nucleic acids, amino acids, and lipids. Four classes of chemicals. Just remember in that car, there, were, there was steel, there was aluminum, there was rubber, there was plastic. You have, you have basic classes. That's what it is for life. Then they'll publish a paper making bold assertions about origin of life from these functionless crude mixtures of stereochemically scrambled intermediates, much like Miller did in 1952, which was a great experiment. But uh, uh, nothing's changed since 1952. You engage with the ever-gullible ever press to dial up the knob of unjustified extrapolations, watch the mesmerized layperson say, you see, scientists understand how life was formed. And then you encourage a generation of textbook writers to make colorful, deceptive cartoons of raw chemicals assembling together, which then emerge as slithering creatures from a prehistoric pond. That's what's taught. So here's the synthesis problem. Molecules that compose living systems always show, almost always show homochirality. That means that you can have a left-handed and a right-handed molecule, and they're non-superimposable. That's why you can't put a right hand in a left-handed glove. And nature will almost always make one and not the other. And how does that happen? Well, now we have enzymes that construct these because you have biology. And then if something is constructed in a wrong way, you have other enzymes that check it and break it up to make sure it doesn't contaminate the system. But how that formed on a prebiotic earth, pre-enzymes, there were no structures there to build, nobody knows. Nobody knows, absolutely clueless, how this came about. When building molecular systems, constant redesigns are needed, which take the synthesis back to step one. You make a mistake, you put on a group, you can't take it off again. It's stuck there. You have to go all the way back to step one very often. You have to go back to step one. And the problem is that, that um, uh, uh, it's often impossible to remove it. So how do you go back to step one? But remember, nature, if it's going toward life, which it doesn't know that it's going there because it doesn't have a brain, it's just a prebiotic earth, it doesn't even know its target. It doesn't even know. So if it puts on a group, it doesn't know that it put on the wrong group. It doesn't know because it has no brain. Nobody knows how this thing is solved. Uh, the, the 
synthetic reactions don't know how to stop their course of pr progression or why to stop. There's no targeted goal. So say you did make an amino acid. You don't, you don't just say, ah, I got it. I'll put it in a bottle. No. That amino acid will go on to something else because it doesn't know to stop there. It doesn't know that it wants that. Time, although claimed to be the great savior of abiogenesis, can actually be the enemy. For example, carbohydrates are kinetic products. They caramelize or they undergo a Carnazzaro reaction. It breaks them down. The very conditions that make them cause them to decompose. That's why when a chemist runs a reaction, they'll wait for that system to be optimized, and then boom, they, they, they stop the reaction, they fish this thing out before it goes bad. The very conditions that make it cause decomposition. How did it know to stop at that particular carbohydrate? It didn't. A prebiotic system does not have the ability to easily purify structures. If you can't purify things, you, it just gums up the works. A chemist will make something, purify it, bring it on to the next step. Because if you keep leaving the wrong compounds in there, they suck up the, the usable starting material, and you get these gross mixtures that then attack the product you want. Reagent addition order is essential. You can't add the icing to the cake when you're just mixing the eggs and the flour. You have to add the icing last. Chemistry is like that over and over again. There's a specific reagent addition order. How do you do that? How did that happen in, in a prebiotic earth when you have 100 steps to make something? How do, you, how do you have the order right? Nobody knows. The parameters of temperature, pressure, solvent, light, no light, atmospheric gases, everything has to be controlled to build a complex system. Characterization is very important. If you can't characterize, you don't know what you have. So a chemist will characterize, and characterization often takes longer than the synthesis itself. How are things characterized in biology? Again, you have enzymes that check structures. But remember, remember, this is a prebiotic earth. There are no enzymes to check structure. Nobody knows how characterization is done. A chemist cannot make things without doing characterization. The mass transfer problem. Uh, the lights are really in my eyes, so I can't see very well up here. But are there any synthetic organic chemists here? You're going to have to not just raise your hand. You're going to have to say yes, because I can't see anything out there. No synthetic organic chemists here? Anybody? All right, well, then you, you don't know. I mean, you have to believe anything I tell you. But the mass transfer problem is the killer of all roots. So you start with a kilogram of material. You might try to get to a target five steps away. And then what happens, you try many things, and then you, you, you try to, and so you get there, and you started with a kilogram, you may end up with 10 milligrams. So what do you do? You go back, and you bring up some more. And you start with, but now you look at your notebook as to what worked, and so now you can bring it through in much higher yield because you optimized it going through. But the problem with, with, with uh, origin of life experiments, say it took 300 million years to get from point A to point B, and now you run out of material. So say, well, just go back and make some more. Well, I, I don't know how to go back because I never kept their laboratory notebook, the Earth says. When you don't keep a record of it, you don't know how to go back, so you're stuck. You, mass transfer is you're constantly making starting materials and bringing them through the routes that you had worked out previously. Nature keeps no laboratory notebook, so it doesn't know how to go back, or it doesn't even know why it would want to go back. It's got no brain. So this is one of the, the motors that you saw that spins at 3 million rotations per second. This is how it's made. This just this one step in this box where you, you generate this, this intermediate and, and it attacks this, this thiocarbonyl to make this episulfide. Look at the temperature controls here. Minus five, first five degrees, then minus 10 to minus 15, then minus 50. And then we go through these steps where we, we, we have other steps where we heat this thing up to 130. This one's at 60. And you say, well, what, what's with all the temperature changes? Why, why do you do this? Well, we just like changing temperature. <laughs> no, because you have to. You have to. People say, well, this would form on the edge of a glacier. OK. And what about this one? We're well, going to get to minus 50. And uh, there you're going to have to be you know, in the atmosphere someplace, really high up, maybe, maybe on top of Mount Everest. OK. And then this one is at 130. Oh, that one's on the edge of a volcano. OK. And so you've got to take these materials, and you've got to transport them between all these places. It's hard to even think of. Just this one step, this one route in this box, this is what it would look like to a trained chemist. You take an oven-dried three-neck round-bottom flask. What if you don't oven-dry it? It doesn't work. 
charged with hydrozone 33 and magnesium sulfate. These precise amounts were added to dichloromethane. To the suspension was quickly added manganese dioxide at about 5 degrees. This was immediately cooled. And, and then you go through this. This is hard to do. Nobody knows how this kind of chemistry can happen on a prebiotic earth. But you read Origin of Life experiments, they'll go through stuff like this with no rationale. And how would that ever happen on, an, on, on a prebiotic earth? They never address that. Then after you make it, you got to characterize it. So we put this in our instruments that are a few million dollars that, that give these peaks. And from these peaks, you can decipher the chemical structure. And it takes a long time to learn how to know that these peaks mean that structure. And this is just a partial NMR. This is, it, it goes much further out, just a partial amount of it. Now, so when we describe to our colleagues how we figured this out, this is what you got to write, all right? But that's just part one, and then you have part two. So you have to convince your colleagues, you got to, it's a hard to characterize. You say, well, early Earth never had to do that. Why not? Well, they didn't have an NMR. Well, when you don't have an instrument like this, how do you do characterization? You don't have enzymes around to do characterization. Characterization is really hard. Nobody knows how this thing is solved. So when we made these motorized nanocars, we had 281 pages of supplemental material, like those last two pages I showed you, to convince the world that we made what we got. It's hard to characterize. Nobody knows about how characterization was done. And then the first car we made, it would, the motor would spin at 1.8 revolutions per hour. Not very fast. But you pull out that sulfur atom and you close that down to a five-member ring. Now it spins at 3 million rotations per second. So small changes make dramatic differences. Well, how do you get rid of that sulfur atom? Well, you just erase it. So you just erase it. <laughs> But really what you have to do is you have to go back to step one. There's no way to pull out that sulfur atom. There's no known methodology to do that, even with all the enzymes that we have. No, no known methodology to extract a sulfur atom. So if you make one little error, you're stuck. You've got to go back to step one. But remember, no laboratory notebook was ever kept. You're in trouble. All right, so that's just making the raw chemicals. We have no idea how the raw chemicals were made, those four classes of compounds, the carbohydrates, the lipids, the amino acids, and, 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 and uh, um, uh, uh, the nucleic acids. We, 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 never, we have no idea how they were made. All right, So we don't have no idea how those car parts were made. Clueless. Now, let's say you had the car parts. Could you assemble it? Well, here's the assembly problem. You have to make what's called a protocell. People call this a protocell. Well, most protocell assembly experiments in Origin of Life can be summarized by this. You purchase homochiral diacetyl lipids. You purchase. You're purchasing the parts. All right, you purchase those. And then you publish, a, and, and then you put those in water. You shake it up. You get these little bubbles. It usually has to go through shear. And so, so uh, you get this bilipid membrane with water inside. And they call this a protocell because they say, this is really like a cell. So let's call it a protocell. It's a self-organized, endogenously ordered spherical collection of lipids proposed as a stepping stone to the origin of life. Then you publish a paper claiming that the synthetic vesicle is a protocell and suggestive of early life forms. Then you engage with the media to ramp up the hype, and the layperson is misled. That's what the assembly experiment. Well, here's the real assembly problem. This is what a real lipid bilayer looks like. It's got a bunch of trans proteins. It's got these sugars on the surface. And it's got all these other things. And so what most protocell experiments will be is they'll take one type of lipid and they'll assemble this. There's been over 40,000 different lipids that are known for, for, uh, uh, these cell, for cellular structures where they form these bilayers. And then the organelles inside each have their own lipids. So you have a lipid bilayer and other lipid bilayers around the mitochondria, some around the nucleus, and they all have their own composition. Nobody knows how to do that, even today in the most modern laboratory. Nobody knows how to take different compositions of, of uh, lipid bilayers and have them assemble in this way where you even have non-symmetric outer and inner, inner side. So in other words, the lipid bilayers on this side are different than the lipid bilayers on this side. This artist drew them all the same. They're different. They have different composition. Nobody knows how to make that even in the most modern labs today. So the protocells that you make, which are like oil in, 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 in vinegar, have nothing to do 
with what, what, a real protocell, what a real cellular membrane looks like. Then you have all these pro proteins going through. These are complex structures that allow certain molecules in and certain molecules out. It allows certain ions in. You have ionophores that allow certain ions in and certain ions out because if you throw off the ionic potential between the inside and the outside of a cell, the cell explodes, undergoes necrosis. There are sugars all over the surface of cells. These are carbohydrate appendages. So let's, and these are huge, but let's just take a simple hexamer, six units of the carbohydrate dipyrnos. Let's compare this to DNA, because when you say DNA has a lot of, can hold a lot of information, whoa, DNA. Okay, let's think about DNA. Say you had six bases of the A base. What's the ways that you can hook those six bases together? A, 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 A. That's it. What's the way that you can hook, how many ways to hook dipyrnos, the simple sugar, together? Over one trillion constitutional and stereochemical isomers. Over one trillion ways you can hook it together. If it's hooked together the wrong way, the cell doesn't work. It dies. This cell is covered with these carbohydrate appendages, usually much bigger than six units, usually much more than just a dipyranose that'll have other sugars, so the number of, con uh, of isomers is much larger. Most people don't know the difference between a million, a billion, and a trillion. Let me help you. So one million seconds is 11 days, all right? Person says, wait, wait a million seconds. Okay, I'll wait 11 days, and then you'll pay me what you owe me. But if they said, wait a billion seconds, that's 32 years. Is that different? If they say, wait a trillion seconds, that's 32,000 years. That's what happens when you go from a million to a billion to a trillion. This has over one trillion isomers, one trillion ways you can hook it together. Nobody knows how those were hooked together. The carbohydrates can carry far more information, far more than DNA itself. Nobody knows how these things are hooked together. And the, the carbohydrates that are made come from an initial DNA template, but then downstream enzymes keep changing these as that cell undergoes other changes and, and through the life of the cell. Nobody knows how this ever could have been done on a prebiotic earth. So how do, how do uh, origin of life researchers address this? They don't, they just don't. So then there's the interactomes. This is the non-covalent interactions that, that happen within a cell. If you just take a very simple cell, like a yeast cell, and you look at just the protein-protein interactions, what is this? This means that the molecules that are non-covalently, they're not hooked together, they're just lined up next to each other. Those are the non-covalent interactions. Information passes through these at the speed of light. These are non-bonded interactions. Uh, uh, chemists will call this the electron cloud, this, the, the, this electron cloud interaction between them. Physicists call it a virtual photon going between them. This occurs at the speed of light. Information is transferred at the speed of light through non-covalent interactions. You have to have the right arrangements. If you just look at protein-protein combination, not protein nucleic acid, just protein-protein interactions in a cell, in a simple yeast cell, you can have 10 to the 79 billion combinations. Well, how big is that? Well, all the particles in the universe is estimated as 10 to the 90. Here's the number of combinations you can have of protein-protein interactions within a cell. This is a huge number. This is whopping big. Remember, this is all the elemental particles in the universe. You say, do you mean all the atoms in the universe, or do you mean all the, the neutrons, electrons, and protons in the universe? It doesn't matter. The difference between those is only like a factor of 100. We're talking numbers that are factors of 79 billion. This, this is just crazy big numbers. Nobody knows how, the, how, this thing, how these things come together. And I'm just scratching the surface of, of, of the complexity within a cell. That's the basic unit you have to have for life. All right. So, proto-turkeys. Origin of life protocell assembly is akin to buying 20 pounds of sliced turkey meat, adding a gallon of turkey broth, warming, sticking in a few feathers, and suggesting that a live turkey will eventually come gobbling out, if given enough time, or that a proto-turkey or extant turkey has been synthesized. And this is what protocell experiments are like. 
they, they don't address the complexity at all. And they talk about this nonsense like we're almost in life. <laughs> then there's the origin of information. Critical for life is the origin of information. DNA or RNA. The information is primary, the matter is secondary. Information is primary. Matter is secondary. You can store information, you can write it on a piece of paper, or you can type it into your computer. It's the same information, but it's stored in two different mediums. The medium is not the important thing as much as the information itself. Nobody, does, nobody knows where the information come, came from. We can't even get the matter, the carbohydrates, the nucleic acids, the lipids, and the proteins. We can't even get that let alone the information. So even if you had the nucleic acids, you don't know the order to hook that thing up to be the, the template, the prescription for the enzymes to form to build that cell. Nobody knows where the code of information came from. Clueless. All right, try to build a cell even hypothetically. Assemble a dream team of all your best professors, and you say, can you make a living cell if given if you were to give them the chemicals in homochiral form and the informational code. So say, I'll give you all the chemicals, can you build a cell? No. All right, I'll give you the informational code, I'll give you DNA in any order that you want, I'll give it to you. I'll give you the RNA in any order that you want. I'll even give you the enzymes all assembled, I'll give you the, the lipids all in homochiral form, whatever lipids you want. I'll give you all the proteins, all the ionophores, all the carbohydrates in whatever form you want. Here they are, all in separate bottles, in your modern laboratory, not under a rock outside, but could you make a cell? And anybody in their right mind would say, no way. I have no idea how to put, assemble those together into a cell. And even if I could, I, I, I don't know how to get the thing running that would spark life. We have no idea. You say, well, you've read about synthetic cells. In 2010, Craig Venter's team copied an existing bacteria, bacterial genome and transplanted it into another cell. They call that a synthetic cell. So I buy a Corvette. What I do is I take out the computer control box, and I take out the chip, a little chip about that big, and I go into my fabrication facility, and I copy that chip, make a copy of that chip. And then I take that chip that I made, I stick it back in, and boom, the car runs. Can I say, I made that Corvette? No, you didn't make that Corvette. You just copied an existing chip. You just copied an existing, and you stuck that into the nucleus. That's not a synthetic cell. Everything was already there. You can't do that on early earth. You need all these other pieces. So here's what our students are learning. This is in What is Life by uh, E. Regis, a science writer. Life began with little bags of garbage, random assortments of molecules, doing some crude kind of metabolism. This is stage one. The garbage bags grow and occasionally split into two, and the ones that grow and split fastest win. That's what they teach people in school. Few origin of life researchers would state it so shamelessly. Nonetheless, little bags of garbage are precisely what they've been making. Those little bags of garbage have no more resemblance to living cells than a big bag of garbage resembles a horse. It's just not there. It's, they're clueless on how this happens. So how close have researchers come to making artificial life? In November of 2018, there was this article that came out in Science. They say, biologists create the most lifelike artificial cells yet. So I go, whoa, I want to see that. What have they done? So they're citing this, an article from, from, that was published in Nature Communications. And so I read about it. Here's what they did. They took semi-porous microcapsules made of plastic. They took plastic from acrylate polymerization, and they went into a fabrication facility, and they made these little spheres of plastic, and they had these wraparound clay. So you put clay inside because clay is positively charged, DNA is negatively charged. And then, then what they do is they take DNA, they, they, they take these little plastic spheres, they put it in a, in a beaker of, of water at the right ionic concentration, they add DNA to this, DNA goes through these semi-porous capsules and sticks to the clay. Because clay is positive, DNA is negative, it's gonna stick to the clay. And then what they do is they buy ribosomes RNA, enzymes, reagents, and they purchase this, or they extract it from limb systems, they throw that in there, those go in too, and you start getting protein synthesis. This is not life. When you take vinegar and baking soda and you mix those two together and a reaction occurs and you get CO2 coming out, that's not life. That's just a chemical reaction. Nobody calls that life. So they, they take all the pieces 
of nature that you know. This is done every day. Every day in the lab, you mix chemicals together and you get protein synthesis because you bought nature's constructs from these chemical companies that have extracted this, extracted this from living cells. And then they say, well, there's quorum sensing because the nearer ones can sense each other because there's diffusion between them. Whatever is closer in the solution is going to get hit by more by its neighbor than something far away. This is normal diffusion. It's not quorum sensing. So the chemistry of exogenously added reagents will work regardless of the container. It can be a pl plastic semi-porous microcapsule or in a test tube like we do all the time in the lab or in a large-scale industrial production tank. This is done all the time in industry. This is just chemistry. It has nothing to do with gene expression and communication rivaling that of living cells. There's no rivalry, none. Any chemist will look at this and say, there's nothing here. One might arguably agree that these are indeed the most life-like artificial cells yet, but that only serves to underscore the point. Nobody's ever come close to generating the workings of life. Not even close. It's fool's gold. If you take iron, and alchemists learned that you could take iron, you could add sulfur to it, you get something that looks like gold. And, and it's, it's actually called pyrite, it's iron sulfide, it's a naturally occurring compound. Now they knew they had not made gold because it, has this, it doesn't have the same ductility and, and uh, uh, it doesn't have the same melting point. But would they have thought, well, we're getting pretty close. You know, just leave us alone. Just let, let us keep doing this. No, you can add sulfur forever to all the elements you want. You're not going to turn that other element into gold by adding sulfur. It's never going to turn into gold that way. The only way you can make gold from another element is you change the number of protons. And then you need a nuclear reactor, and it's very expensive to do that, much more than gold. All right, so I'm calling for a timeout on origin of life research. That, that a change is warranted. We've got to figure out where life's code is. We've got to think about how the assembly into interactomes, the mass throughput, or tell me why this isn't even important. But we haven't moved in 67 years since Miller-Urey. Nothing has changed. We're nowhere closer to life. In fact, we're further away from life than, we, than, than, than figuring out where, we're further away than, uh, than we were in 1952 from figuring out where life came from. And the reason is because we're not shooting at a, stag a, 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 a static target, a cell. The cell becomes more complex every year as we learn about it. So the target is harder. So how do you know if you're getting close to solving something? You look at where you've come, but we're further away than we were in 1952. So that's why I say, let's have a timeout. I wanted to call it a moratorium, a cessation. But that scares people. So how, okay, let's just have a timeout, all right? Timeout, that's what you guys do here on your football field, right? Time, official timeout, and let's, let's, let's start something else here. All right. Now, let's think about evolution, because, because I just talked about uh, origin of life, and many students think about evolution. So let's think about evolution, too. Evolution is both about the mechanism by which change occurs over time and the theory of universal common descent. So in 2016, I really wanted to try to understand evolution. So I went to my colleagues, and, uh, uh, and this is what the geneticists told me. This is a quote from them. Evolution is both about the mechanism, that's their own words, by which change occurs over time. Okay, so I've got to figure out the mechanism. And the theory of universal common descent. Universal common descent. So let me just start by saying, I've looked over the data from universal common descent. I can understand why those fluent in the field of genetics would be convinced by the theory, if universal, uh, uh, by the theory, this should be by the theory of universal common descent. There's an impressive quantity and insightfulness to the work. It really is remarkable. But let's, let's look a little bit more deeply here. So common descent versus uncommonness. Humans have about 20,000 protein coding genes. That means we have strips on our DNA that will code for RNA that will make these proteins that build our bodies. And this is why you can eat something today and it becomes a part of your body tomorrow, these little, little nanomachines that are there. Now, this is on 1.5% of our genome. That's it. The other 98.5% was formerly called junk DNA. So there was a large-scale project instituted by the U.S. National Human Genome Research Institute in 2003 called Project ENCODE, and it sought to figure out what's the function of the other 98.5% of the DNA in the human genome. Because this was called junk DNA. They said it had no function. 
Well, it turns out they don't call it junk anymore. It's called intergenic regions. So there's ENCODE evidence that part or even much of the intergenic regions have regulatory elements that can affect gene transcription, the building of RNA, the, con the construction of enzymes. So the uncommonness is noted in the intergenic regions, not the common 1.5% protein coding genes. So when people say we are 99.9% the same as a chimpanzee, they are correct when you look at 1.5% of the genome. There's differences that occur in the 98.5% of the genome. All right, common descent versus uncommonness. Work on orphan genes, also called orphans, casts new light on the uniqueness of some genetic information. Orphan genes are considered unique to a narrow taxon, generally a species. Therefore, orphan genes are, again, markers for uncommonness. All right, the uncommon human being. <clears throat> Humans alone have the capacity for art, music, advanced communication, advanced mathematics, and religious practice, which constitute the broader organization of symbolism. Therefore, if one is intent upon a common descent model, there was a massive and presently unexplainable infusion, intrinsic or extrinsic, along the proposed very short descent pathway from Australia Pithecines to modern humans. Okay, so what do I mean? So when people say, that, that, that we have a common ancestor. So, so the idea is that there's a common ancestor from this bridges off the line that's going to go toward humans and then the line toward chimpanzees. Not that chimpanzees are in our line, but we are from a common, uh, a common ancestor. So that, that's, that's what, what is believed. Now, if you look at this descent pathway, just before you hit humans, you have either ne ne Neanderthals or Australopithecines, right there. So between Neanderthals slash Australopithecines, to us, something happened in our brains that make us who we are, that allow us to wa work in this broader organization of symbolism, where we can do advanced mathematics. You can describe something to a person. You can say, I want you to go out this room, walk 10 feet north, 3 feet uh, 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 west and dig a hole seven inches in the ground and you're going to find a piece of paper with a code on it. And anybody can do that. Try to, try to explain that to a chimpanzee. I mean, there's clearly differences here. Something has happened here. So something happened in this, in this descent pathway. If it were an intrinsic ex in, infusion, if the infusion were intrinsic, then the requisite anatomical or chemical differences between the modern human brain and other hominid brains are presently indiscernible and unfathomable. And the chemical basis of evolutionary mechanisms, remember, that was their word. It's all about mechanisms. For such changes is both unknown and presently immeasurable. If the infusion were extrinsic, then the materialist evolutionist and the supernaturalist have common ground. Something happened between Australia Pithecines and the human brain, if you want to go by a common descent model. And we have no idea of the mechanism by which the brains changed to go from no symbolism to symbolism. No idea of the mechanism. All right, <clears throat> here's, a, here's another, the mechanism problem. If you look at a body plan change, this is all from Wikipedia. Body plan is how our limbs are, are, are projected from our bodies. Human beings are different than elephants and how our limbs are projected. And, and so <clears throat> there's this, this blueprint of symmetry, segmentation, body plans. It is believed that body plans evolve in a flash in the Cambrian explosion. But a more nuanced understanding of animal evolution suggests that the gradual development of body plans uh, through the early period of the Paleozoic. Nobody knows the mechanism for this. Nobody understands how a complex system changes. <clears throat> so the mechanism problem. Any massive functional change of a body part would require multiple concerted lines of variations. Sure, one can suggest multiple small changes ad infinitum. You ask a biologist, how does that happen? One small change at a time. And? What do you mean, one small change at a time? But the concerted requirement of multiple changes all in the same place at the same time is impossible to chemically fathom. One day, the requisite chemical basis might become apparent so that the question can be answered. But present day biology is far from providing even a chemical proposal for this functional change, let alone a data substantiated chemical mechanism. So when I ask my colleagues, show me change in a complex system, 
they, they will throw at me the, the immune system, which the immune system morphs on what's presented to it. It does. It's amazing. But I say, but it remained an immune system. It never became a digestive system, an optical system, an auditory system. It stayed the system that it was. Show me the mechanism, even a proposal, on how you could change one complex system to another, which you have to have all the time in evolution. And they're clueless. They say, oh, this is all well known. If you are a biologist here, you are angry with me right now. <laughs> but I ask you to do this, because it's, I, 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 want you, I want you to passivate your anger by doing this. Find for me the articles showing the chemical mechanism for the change in a complex system. You can't find it. You say, oh, no, these are well known. I have spoken to biologists, and every time a biologist has opposed me, I said, find me the reference. And so then they never send me the reference. So I ping them. I get there, and I, and I where's the references you're going to I'm very busy. <laughs> OK? Well, I understand you're busy, but how about next week? Could you send me the mechanisms? And they said, you could look this up yourself. I said, I haven't been able to find it. This happens repeatedly with me, because as soon as you go to look, you're not going to find Remember, chemical mechanism is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This is what you got to show me a mechanism. And so when it comes to evolution of a complex system, evolutionary biology has been reduced to storytelling with little chemical mechanistic data to support the claims. It's just not there. There is no, no chemical mechanistic data to support change in a con in a, of a complex system. So there's collective cluelessness. Therefore, I don't understand the mechanism needed to change the body plans or the mechanism along the descent pathway between Australia's Pythocene brain and the modern human brain, if we were indeed commonly descended as predicted by the, the theory of universal common descent. I don't understand it. You'd think that I could understand it. If high school kids can understand I should be able to understand this. And nobody else understands the mechanism either. Nobody. But unlike most, I'm saying it publicly. That's what's causing the trouble, because I'm saying it publicly. All right, now I'm bringing back God, God back in. You see, I never mentioned God. Science was able to critique science. But I'm not here to preach God of the gaps, to say, as a scientist, I would never say that we will never understand. One day in the distant future, we might understand life's origin and evolution of a complex system. We might. If you asked a researcher in 1850, where is the code for life stored in a cell? They would have been clueless. It was just a bunch of protoplasm. Well, then we learned in the 1950s that it's stored in DNA. So we learn things over time. It's just that we don't know it now. If we find out, that's not going to lessen God, but we'll see him as all the more magnanimous. Oh, that's how you did it. That's amazing. It doesn't lessen God to know these things. So let's investigate this, but don't act as if we know this. All right, have so-called scientific facts ever before been shown to be wrong? Well, does the universe have a beginning? Scientific fact, quote unquote, changed in 1964. The steady state theory replaced the Big Bang theory. In, in the 1950s, the vast majority of scientists believed that the universe had no beginning. And they had all sorts of theories on, on, on how this, this the matter was dumping into the universe. It wasn't until 1964, with the discovery of microwave background radiation, that, that people understood that indeed the Big Bang Theory was correct in the sense that the universe had a beginning. So scientific fact, quote unquote, changed in 64. Darwinian theory to punctuated equilibrium, scientific fact changed in 72. Eldridge and Gould proposed that the degree of gradualism commonly attributed to Charles Dar Darwin is virtually non-existent in the fossil record. So in other words, the fossil record is showing that there's no change. And then all of a sudden, in a brief period, poof, this huge amount of change, this brief period being, say, 100,000 years. And then nothing changes again for millions of years. Climate change killed off the dinosaurs. That scientific fact changed in 1980 when it became due to the asteroid impact, the Alvarez hypothesis, where an iridium-rich asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula, threw dirt into the air. That obscured the sun. The plants died. The herbivores died, then the carnivores died, and that's what wiped out the dinosaurs. It wasn't due to climate change. That fact changed in 1980. Random mutation versus natural selection. Many of you here learned that, that uh, uh, evolution is all about random mu mutation and natural selection. Guess what? Not anymore. It's just, 
uh, as suggested by Darwin, was taught as fact and are recognized by many evolutionists since the 1990s to be insufficient to account for the complexity of life. Neutral drift is quantitatively more important in understanding genetic differences between organisms. That means that small changes in the DNA between me and my son, my son and his son, and going onward. <clears throat> so that's neutral drift. So this is another fact that changed. How long ago did dinosaurs become extinct? Or you could reword this, how stable is soft tissue? Scientific fact is being questioned since 2007 when Mary Higby Schweitzer, a paleontologist at NC State, led a group that discovered the remains of blood cells in dinosaur fossils and later discovered soft tissue r remains in Tyrannosaurus rex. In 2015, researchers reported finding structures similar to blood cells and collagen, that's protein, collagen fibers preserved in bone fossils of six Cretaceous dinosaur specimens, which are supposedly 75 million years old. You have organic matter around for 75 million years? Nobody can understand this. Blood cells around for 75 million years? You say, but there's not too many discoveries of this. Oh, no, they're, now they're discovering lots and lots of it. Or how long does soft, stable, uh, soft tissue stay around? Every proposal that I've seen uh, about this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so there's a lot of things we just don't know that are put forth as fact. What's the ramification of calling conjectures facts? Is the claims that mislead the patient taxpayer are un unhelpful and the public will eventually distrust scientific claims even into other fields. Uncorrected or unfounded assertions jeopardize science beyond a singular field, especially since there's mounting distrust of higher education in general. It is very rare for scientists to come up and say, Oh, I had that wrong. Sorry. Condescending comments toward the public or a student, if they will not embrace our conjectures as facts, will lead to continued division between scientists and non-scientists, which can yield public reluctance to fund our research. We must tell the truth with specificity. If it's a fact, say it. If it's not a fact, say it. Blackballing scientists if they bear legitimate nonconformist views by excluding them from professional societies and academies, withholding their funding or denying them tenure is anti-scientific and it will retard the advancement of science. All right, are, are there any things that, is there, is there a, a controversy between scientific fact and the Bible? Well, what is a fact? Water, H2O, has two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. That will always be the same anywhere you go in the universe, that is a fact. There has never been discordance between scientific facts and statements in the Bible, so there's no need to reconcile them. So-called scientific facts, which are really theories, are constantly changing, even on the order of decades and certainly on the order of a century. So trying to twist the Bible to fit the scientific theory is a frustrating endeavor. Don't let professors with their bold claims of facts upset you. Theories or conjectures are not facts. But unfortunately and shamefully, many professors themselves do not make the necessary distinctions. This leads to the confusion of generations of students and even professors themselves. I deal with professors all the time. They're, they're so many times they're clueless on this. So to the student inundated with misinformation, if you're a believing student, believing in the Bible, God gives us something. When he was speaking of false prophets, he said this, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commandments and obey him, serve him and hold him fast. Maybe God's trying to see, do you really love him? These scientific quote unquote facts that you're saying have drawn you away from your faith, let me know, are they really facts? Are they really? Let me tell you about how I came to faith in Jesus Christ. I'm, I was born into a secular home just outside of, uh, in, in New York City and grew up just outside of New York City. Uh, when I was in college at the age of 18, I was, I was doing laundry in the laundry room and, and I met a guy and he had me read this verse. We got to talking and he said he was on the football team. I said, do you want to play pro ball when you graduate? He says, I'm not good enough for that. I said, what do you want to do? He said, oh, I want to go into lay ministry. I said, what's lay ministry? I mean, Jews don't know what lay ministry is, all right? And, I, and he says, oh, it's just like being a missionary. And I said, missionary? Why would you want to be a missionary? It's 1977. We got TV. Just beam it in there. <laughs> and he said, could I give you an illustration of the gospel? I said, sure. I, I, fine. I, I didn't even know what he meant. I thought he was going to draw a picture. And then he drew a picture. He drew this. There were no computers back then. He drew this on a piece of paper. 
And he had me read this verse from the Bible, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He had man separated from God by sin. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not a sinner. I said, I'm not a sinner. I never killed anybody and I never robbed a bank. How could I be a sinner? Then he had me read another verse of all verses. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now there was a problem. I was 18 years old. <laughs> and this was my life. <laughs> and I was addicted to pornography. From, from, uh, for years I'd just, just been, been fed with pornography. And, and uh, um, that, that was the first time that I looked at this, I said, if that's the nef- definition of sin, then I'm a sinner. That was the first realization that I was a sinner. Then he had me read another verse, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. By grace, he, he said, this grace is an unmerited favor, undeserved gift. God is giving you an undeserved gift. Again, it's a gift through faith. This is an interesting, interesting gift. This gift you receive through faith. Most gifts you have to take it. This gift you receive through faith. It's an interesting gift. You receive it by faith. It's a gift of God. It is not a result of works. I remember him drawing these arrows. Good works are not necessarily bad, but they will never get you to God because God is perfect and you are a sinner. There's nothing you can do. There's this feeling that people have, well, If my good works somehow outweigh my bad works, then I'll get to heaven. Not according to the Bible. It's not a result of works. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I remember he said this wages of sin is this eternal separation from God, is this death. But there it is again, a gift, a free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is a free gift. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is a demonstration of love. Jesus died for me. I didn't even know there was a claim on the table that Jesus had died for me. We never discussed this in my home. Never. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is a salvation that is for sinners. If you're not a sinner, this is not for you. Go get your salvation somewhere else. The Bible says Christ died for the ungodly. If if you're godly, again, this salvation is not for you. He died for the ungodly. God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He offered up his son. What are you going to do? You're walking down the road. You're walking down the sidewalk. You're you're holding the hand of your three-year-old. You're walking down the the road. And a big dog comes running toward you, growling and foaming at the mouth. What are you going to do? You're going to take this kid and hold this kid out and say, take, take the kid, leave me alone. You're going to do that? No. Anybody's going to pull this kid away. They're going to let the dog even bite them to protect the child. This is normal. God says, I'm going to demonstrate my love to you. I'm going to take my son, who I love so much, and I'm going to give him up for you. This is the greatest demonstration of love. He demonstrated his love. Jesus bridged this gap, and I remember he drew this cross just like that across there. And then this is a key verse, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now this is like a crazy hard verse. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. How can you set this as a bar for salvation that you've got to believe in your heart in the resurrection? I've never seen a resurrection. It's hard to believe in this. I've never heard of a resurrection other than in this case. I've never heard. How how can there be a resurrection? You set that as a bar for salvation? That gets you to God. So the night of November 7, 1977, I was right in that room, room 1812 at the Lawrence Dormitory. I was all alone in my room. He shared with me in August. Now it's November. I had carried this burden of sin. I knew I was a sinner. And in room 1812, on that day, I got on my knees and I said, Lord, forgive me because I am a sinner. Lord, forgive me because I am a sinner and come into my life. And 
what was interesting is all of a sudden this burden of sin started to lift and this forgiveness started pouring in on me. And then someone was standing in my room. The door hadn't opened. My roommate wasn't there. Someone was in my room right next to me. And I opened my eyes and I couldn't see with my eyes. But the presence of God was so strong right there. And I just started weeping like a baby. And love was being poured out to me. Love. And Jesus stood right next to me and poured out love to me. And I wasn't scared. I just enjoyed his presence. He wasn't going anywhere. And I was just crying and saying, something happened to me that day. Finally, when I composed myself, I didn't tell anybody. What's this Jewish kid from New York City going to say? What am I going to say? And then two weeks later, the guy who had shared with me, he lived on the 18th floor as well, and he saw me in the hallway there. He says, Jim, have you received Jesus in your heart? I said, I think I have. Why do you ask? He said, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. Something happened to me that day. And I asked him, how can I keep this feeling of closeness? He said, you read your Bible every day. You'll stay close to God. You don't, you won't. That was digital for me, and I could do that. I've read my Bible every day for over 40 years. And I start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I read through to Revelation chapter 22, and when I'm done, I start again, and I pick up where I left off the day before. You got a problem with that reading program? Don't use it. But that's what I did. I figured it's a book. I'm going to read a book. How do you read a book? You read a book from beginning to end. And you just read it again. And I've read that book every day my, for my life. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Think about that. The God of all the universe. He says, I will wipe out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. You will remember your sins. But God said, I won't. He won't. What is this for my own sake? Let me put it this way. If my son were in jail, I would go bail him out. If he said, Dad, I deserve to be here, I would say, too bad, you're my son, you're coming out. We'll deal with the other problems later, but you're coming out. For his own sake. Some people feel themselves too unworthy of so great a gift. For his own sake. He's not going to remember your sins. I bring you back to the same verse. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Every week I see somebody come to the Lord. I only speak to educated people. I speak to Rice undergraduates or graduate students or postdocs or professors or physicians from the biggest medical center in the world, 120,000 employees in the medical center across the street. Lots of physicians around. I speak to them. Every week I see somebody come to the Lord. Every week I see somebody believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus rose from the dead, it was physical. He appeared to his disciples. So they thought they were seeing a ghost. He says, uh-uh, guys. Look, I got flesh and bones. Feel it. And he says, you got something here to eat? And they said, give him a piece of fish. because Jesus loved fish. He was always multiplying fish for people to eat. And, and they gave him a piece of fish, and he ate it. He said, spirits don't eat. And he ate in front of them. They, they wanted to stick their finger in the hole in his hand and their hand in the hole in his side, and he invited them to do it. Do it. He rose from the dead physically. I see every week someone go from not believing in the resurrection to believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a 10-minute conversation. How do you get an educated person to go from not believing in the resurrection to believing in the resurrection in a 10-minute conversation? How does that happen? The only explanation I have is that the truth of the resurrection is already in your heart. It's already there. This is too high a barrier. I couldn't convince you of Santa Claus in 10 minutes. But the resurrection of the dead is already in your heart. If you do not know the Lord, I urge you, I beg you, I invite you this very day, confess what's already there, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. He would never make this as a barrier for salvation if it weren't already there among his elect. It's already there. Confess to what's already there that Jesus is Lord and believe in the resurrection from the dead. I'm going to pray. And if you do not know the Lord, I ask you to invite him into your life even now as I pray. Pray with me, please.
Lord Jesus, forgive me because I am a sinner. I believe that Jesus is Lord, and I believe that he has risen from the dead. Forgive me, and now fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me just say, I just recently started a, 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 a YouTube channel and it's on Facebook, and it's on Instagram, and we're moving it into these other platforms. It's just drjamestour.com. You put that in, and, and I'm putting a bunch of things on there because uh, it, I have a lot of videos on the internet have been posted by, uh, by others, uh, but here I'm just speaking to you know, these simple messages, short little things, some about science, some about faith. Many people say, how can you be a scientist with faith? And so I show you, I give you a little thing about faith and then give you a thing about science. This is how you do it. Science, faith, science, faith. That's how you be a scientist with faith. Okay, I'll leave it at that and I'll open it up for questions. And we got a microphone here and we'll take questions. I think you have to come up here and uh, um, Eric will hold the microphone. And I ask you, please ask your question in the form of a question. And, uh, and, and I know everybody's got a diatribe. Not here, not now. Uh, just ask your question. If you don't have a question, then then uh, uh, don't come up. All yeah, right. so uh, I'll just have the mic up here. Come up and ask the question. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, at the very beginning, uh, in your first slide, you said, you said something that just hit me very, uh, very quickly. That was, you had mentioned about nanotechnology and optic nerves, something like going on with that. Would you, would you elaborate on that sure. for me? Sure. Just as, as we saw the healing in the, in the spinal cord, we're trying to get an optic nerve to reconnect. Because if you can do optic nerve, you can do whole eye transplant. The blood vessels can be done. The muscles can be done. It was being able to cut one, one optic nerve and hook on another one. Because you've got to cut at the optic nerve, take the new eye, put it in, and put it in there. Nobody's ever seen the reconnection of an optic nerve. And so we're working on using the same technology that we use for the spinal cord to do an optic nerve reconnection. And then if we can do that, then we can uh, uh, do a whole eye transplant. So I, I've had a, I have a student of mine in a laboratory in Colorado where they just uh, study eye transplants. And he's brought this technology into that lab and that's what they're working on. Well, Dr. Tour, thanks for coming out. Um, my question is about um, panspermia and um, uh, when people talk about extraterrestrial terrestrial origins yeah. as being a possible uh, yeah. source of the uh, abiogenesis. So I was yeah. just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Right. I, I'm fine with, 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 with aliens bringing life here to Earth. I'm fine. But I'm not talking about just origin of life. I'm talking about first life, origin of first life. That had to start somewhere. You want to translate it to another planet, and then somehow it came here either on a meteorite or, 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 or some other creatures planted it here. I'm fine. You still got to deal with first life. So we translate that to somewhere else in the universe. I'm okay with that. It's still the same problems. The same problems are going to hit there. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. James, for being here. So my question is that what is your response to the notion that some people make that 99% of people die in the faith that they're born into? So for example, you gave an example that, you know, Jesus came before me, he changed me, while well, other people of other faiths claim that, you know, God revealed to me of, of my faith and he changed my life, and I'm just as much as happy as you are, why should I accept your claim? Like, yeah. you know, there's no possible way of verifying that somebody can rise from the dead, because they will claim that, well, my God did this miracle, and these people witnessed it in this part of the world, and this is 3,000 years old. How would you say to them, like, how would you prove that to them? So? Yeah, so I don't prove anything. I don't prove anything. Um, I'm not here for people's happiness. In fact, the Bible says that all those who desire to walk godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. So I'm not preaching happiness here. Um, when people die in another faith, all I know is what the Bible says. And the Bible says that, that no one comes to the Father but through Jesus Christ. Now, there were many people that were clearly 
saved and had a relationship with God prior to the coming of Jesus to this earth. We have the Old Testament saints, lots of them. And it says that they went and they were in the bosom of Abraham. Jesus described it. They were in the bosom of Abraham. And uh, Jesus went and he took them. He took them with him and he took them to heaven after he had died on the cross. So we have a construct for that in the scriptures. If other people are dying in the... It, dying without ever having heard Christ, I have no idea how God deals with that. But I know that he is righteous and he is just. But I have no idea. I'm not God. I'm just a chemist, actually. <laughs> Nobody else, huh? Come on down if you want to come in. Can you, can you make it? I just want to say, I, I've believed this for a long time, that God is the master scientist. He always has been. I believe that. And I believe when we were children at the age of five years old, subconsciously in our brain, we know there's a God and there's a power. We, we are just given a choice through the years. We choose whether to walk with the Lord or go to the dark side. Am I right? Do you agree with that? Or... Yeah, I, I, I don't know at what age, um, you, you know, there, there's, there's like, this is, this is put on by Ratio Christi. And so there's, there's like half the people in here are apologists, so they'd probably have an answer to that. Um, you know, it, it, it bothers me a lot when, when people talk about science, so talk about, say, chemistry, and they know nothing about chemistry, and they demonstrate it every time they say something. I, I don't know that very well, you know, and, 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 uh, and I'm glad for you, and I'm glad you believe that. As a scientist, I have to separate to say, I believe something. That doesn't necessarily make it true. It might be true, but that doesn't necessarily make it so. I, I, can't, I can't say that what you just said is true. I wish I could, but I can't because I have to separate. So when the student says, I believe this happened, I said, what do you mean you believed? Either it did or it didn't. Do you have evidence for that? What is your evidence? Do you don't have it? it doesn't go by what we believe in science. So I'm not sure that I can answer that. Uh, I, I, ju I just don't, I don't have a mechanism to answer that. I know I'm really dull for you people because you want me to take a position. You're very good. But, but I, I just don't, I just can't. One other, do you, well, I shouldn't, are we, do you think we are the higher primate, us human beings? Oh, we're clearly. The I mean, there's, no, no, the, the not, there's nothing else in our class, not, not even close, we are the not even close. Right, right. I mean, throw up a few integrals for, for a chimpanzee and see what they do with it. <laughs> yeah. You know, give, give, them, give them some organic chemistry mechanism and see what they do with that. I mean, it's, it's not even close. Thank you. Just one more quick question. Um, have you read the book Sapiens, and uh, what is your opinion of that? No, I haven't read the book Sapiens, but I'm sure I have it. I get about five books a week sent to me by <laughs> wonderful people, publishers, authors, and just kind people that want me to read things, and like 25 YouTube videos that I'm supposed to read each week, and like 25 or 50 PDF articles that people want me to read each week. And everything is a must read. And I get, and, and uh, um, I frankly don't read any of it. Because I have a day job, and it takes up a lot of time. So I, I don't know the book. Uh, um, uh, I, I read the Bible every day. If you've got a question about that, I can give you a, 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 a non theologian's perspective on it. I'm sorry. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you for coming. In your experience speaking with uh, atheists, non-theists, uh, has there been a common turning point where you would see that this particular uh, information or argument that you're offering to them, is there a most common turning point where you would see someone start to uh, change their position? Yeah. 
So, so I, I, I speak with atheists all the time. Some people think, well, you know, you're speaking with people who come from a background of a Christian home, and so you, you just underscore. A lot of the people that I speak with are from China, and they're coming from communist homes, and they never had anything. And I see them going from, from not believing in the resurrection to believing in the resurrection in a short conversation. And I, I don't use philosophical arguments. I don't know how to do that. And I know that there's people around that do that, and I'm, uh, whatever you use. I just quote exactly the scriptures that I gave you today is what I use with them, one after another, and I bring them right to the resurrection. And they go from not believing it to confessing it and signing up. I get them signed up for a 13-week Bible study. I've never had anybody that I brought through this that didn't agree to a 13-week Bible study an hour a week in something called Growing in Christ by the Navigators Campus Ministry. And so um, uh, it, it's, it's not complex. And I've seen atheists all the time coming to the Lord. I cannot explain this. It's just like I said, how do you explain an educated person going from not believing in the resurrection to wholeheartedly believing in the resurrection, knowing that it's going to change their lives by confessing this. This is a mystery. This is, this is, this is just amazing, and it must be that, that God has placed this on the heart. That's the only way that, that I could think that it could happen, because I have no scientific rationalization for this other than a miracle. And once I claim miracle, I step outside the bounds of the physical sciences, outside the bounds of thermodynamics. It's a miracle, and that's why we call it a miracle, so it can happen. Uh, one thing that um, you didn't mention, that I don't, I'm not sure where it fits in, is um, the flood. I always sort of thought, and I've been to the Creation Museum, that the flood killed the dinosaurs. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that was one question, or let, that, let, what let you me, think let of that. Let me answer that before I forget. So, so, look, I don't know what killed the dinosaurs. And I know that there's claims that the flood killed off the dinosaurs. And, and uh, um, uh, so, so you, you know, there were, there were obviously some dinosaurs that were great swimmers because, mm -hmm. you, you know, we, we have their bones today. Yeah. But, but I'm just telling you that this idea that 77 million years ago, or 60 million years ago, 66 million years ago is the number, the 66. 66 million years ago, dinosaurs died off, scientifically. I just am scratching my head, how do you get soft tissue remaining? And I've looked at people's arguments, you know, Fuzz Rana, for example. I looked at his argument right. for how soft tissue is gonna remain, and I'm like, it's not satisfying to me at all. As, right. a, as a synthetic organic chemist. Right. It doesn't make sense to me. And so I just haven't seen a good explanation. Right. So Act, I'm I sorry, I forgot that. I'd gone to the Creation Museum, and actually they, they did believe that Noah had some dinosaurs there. And I saw that okay. same quote you mentioned that was there that, about the soft tissue that they found oh, okay. that was living. But the other thing, is, you, did you, I want to clarify with the, um, is Neanderthal man the same? It was Austrio... Austroepithecine? Yeah. Is, are, are, to me, there's just man. I, I, don't, I, can't, I can't fathom that God didn't just plain make man. Okay. And I don't... I have never seen in the... Even when I would go to biology classes in high school and stuff, yeah. I don't see that gradation. I see a man. Right. Or right. I see a monkey. <laughs> you know, I see yeah. one or the other. I don't yeah. see anything in between. So in my own mind, there's nothing... There is not Neanderthal, yeah. Neanderthal man. So... Um, well, you, you know... You know um, the, the, there's, there's clearly... Well, I can't say clear. There... We, we have DNA uh, uh, even is even as, as being t detec detected today where many people have segments that look like Neanderthal DNA. And especially in Northern Europe, there are some people that have much higher concentrations of Neanderthal DNA uh, segments within them. You mean alive and, today? Alive today. Yeah. And, and, and so it really looks like there was actually interbreeding between humans and what we're calling Neanderthals. 
And there, you know, if you look in Genesis chapter 6, in Genesis yep. chapter 6, there was interbreeding yep. between, between what many theologians would say would be fallen angels, mm -hmm. uh, between fallen angels and human women. Right. And that, and that is one flood. of the rationales for the flood <laughs> right. coming. So, so uh, what I'm saying is in the DNA, there's, there's even this, and, and you say, well, would humans really interbreed with Neanderthals? Human sexuality never amazes me. <laughs> hu humans, humans try to interbreed with animals today, and those don't even look humanoid, mm -hmm. like a Neanderthal would look. So yeah, I think, I think they certainly would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, so that's I, what I mean. I, I, to me, it, it, Neanderthal, even if you call him Neanderthal, he still was a okay. type of human being. I, 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 I understand to yeah. you it doesn't, but do you see as a scientist, I can't go can around saying, to me, this. No, right. to me, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't just claim all of a sudden to me and put some authority behind it. To me, I feel this way, so it is this way. I can't do that. I respect you, I respect mm -hmm. what you're saying. To you, this is not. That's fine. I can't agree with you on that or else all of a sudden I open myself up to all sorts of attack because scientists aren't allowed to speak that way. We're not allowed to say, to me, this. This is my truth. I'm not allowed to do that. Actually, I'm a scientist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, well, but I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, look, know, I I'm 100 percent behind you. I'm not opposed God, to you. What I have about God in me is far more than what I have as a scientist. I I understand, and I and I'm all for you. I just try to be careful what I claim, because I I want to be honest with people the most that I can. I'm not saying you're dishonest. I'm 100 percent for you. It's just that I can't stand here and say yes to what you've said. I just can't. Because I, 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 don't, I don't have enough evidence to say that. Okay, so you don't think, you do believe that there's millions of years of history? Do I believe there's millions of years of history? You know, so that's another question. How old is the Earth? I can stand here and say the Earth is 13.8 billion years old. Uh, the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and the Earth is 4.8 billion years old. Because I can quote the numbers that astrophysicists throw at me just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to check those numbers, so I have no idea. I don't know how to check them. You know, scientists are trained, like me generally, in one very specific area. I am a trained synthetic chemist. I really understand molecules, what they can do and what they don't do. When you do synthetic chemistry for decades, you really get a feel for what molecules do and what they don't do. You get to know them, they are like your family. And, and, uh, um, and I'm good at that. Uh, in, in fact, some people would say that I'm better than most people with that. But I don't know anything to speak authoritatively on astrophysics or the age of the Earth or the age of the universe. Uh, uh, or, or when the Big Bang occurred. I, can, I just quoted to you the numbers that people say, and I can look really smart by saying those numbers, but I don't know how to check those. So I don't, I don't know what kind of number to throw at that. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't, but there so are other people in here. I mean, there's people in here that probably know, and they're, they're sure of it, until somebody gets another result. But <laughs> I'm, they're sure of it, and, 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 uh, and, and they'll stand on that. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, because I, I have a hard time believing that also that it's I, millions. <laughs> I, 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 got, I, I hear you, and I know where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah so I, I just don't have those numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tor, for coming and talking to us today. Um, so you mentioned that you were uh, suggesting a timeout uh, with uh, some of the, the facts that you mentioned and... Uh, just not having evidence for him. Uh, has that been well received at no, all? No, no, nobody receives this. You think these guys are going to stop with their research? No, no way. But I, I, I will tell you something, an interesting story. So um, uh, that, that, that's, that's similar to that. So somebody wanted to get me, a very rich man, a very, very rich man, said that he would get me together with the top 
five people in Origin of Life research. And, and, uh, um, and I said, sure, let's, let's do it and let's discuss what are the key things that need to be addressed to know that we're going in the right direction here. And uh, um, all the others would not meet. This guy, would, he would fly us to Paris, he'd fly us to London, anywhere we want to go. Business class flights all the way, limos pick us up in our home. And I know he does this because I've gone to others of his meetings like this. And he'll rent a beautiful facility for us and we'll have servants the whole way. Just to discuss this because he's interested in topics like this. None of them would agree. One said, one said that, uh, um, and, and I, I, you, you know, I, I can't say who, they, who it is because, but one said, I would only come if I didn't have to defend anything I've written. <laughs> and another one said, oh, well, Jim Tour's religion has so influenced him, it's no use even talking to him. I don't even bring religion into this topic. They have some religion, maybe, but I don't bring any religion. I've, all my articles on this are purely scientific. I never even bring in some, some, some intelligent designer somewhere. I never even do that. I just say, here's the chemistry. So they, they, they won't get together with me on that, which is, which is quite telling. But one, another thing happened recently. I was recently contacted by a group overseas, someone who works in an origin of life research group. And he's worked in that group for many years. And he said, I was watching one of your videos online, and I was laughing the whole time because I realized you were right on every point. And I said, you know, th this, is, this reminds me of the story of Gideon when he went down to the Midianite camp, and God showed him what they're saying about him. And it, 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 it assured him that he was, going and he was doing the right thing. And, and, and so I said, I never thought I'd hear it from someone in your research group there. He says, oh, I want to tell you, all the students here are watching your video too, and they all agree with you. But I understand with students, you've got to finish up your PhD. you, you just got to do it. So I, I understand that, but the arguments that I'm putting forward the, to the novice, they may think, oh, well, the expert wouldn't agree with them. The arguments that I put forward are strictly chemistry, strictly chemistry arguments, and it's not something you can, you can easily argue with. And in fact, my colleagues, who are not particularly, they're not, they have no dog in this fight. They're just synthetic organic chemists. They look at this and they're like, are you the only guy calling these origin of life people out? <laughs> and, and, and so they just look at the data. So the arguments that I put before you today, if there had been organic chemists here, they're the ones who get it the most. They're the ones who are like, yeah, we have no idea. So. I don't know, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. All right. Oh. Hi, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I noticed that, I think at one point in the presentation you talked about, I believe you referred to like evolution as like a theory, and like you used that word at one point. And I remember, you know, keep hearing that you know, like the word theory has a different meaning in like scientific context, where it's not just a conjecture or hypothesis, but like a well-established um, explanation for the way things are, and there's tons of evidence behind it. And you know, I think I've heard analogies to the theory of evolution being like the theory of special relativity and, and things like that. So uh, you want to comment on that? Sure. So um, look, we, we see quote unquote evolution in the lab all the time. It depends on what you define as evolution. So the word evolution is used so broadly. That's why I kept saying evolution of a complex system. Show me the chemistry behind the evolution of a complex system. We see evolution in the lab all the time depending on what you call evolution. Small changes, with it, you see this all the time. And so it's all lumped together under evolution. That's why I tried, I put on the title, Evolution of a Complex System. Now, as far as a theory, if you would like a different word, we can say a conjecture. We can say a proposal. Uh, but these are proposals. They are conjectures based upon evidence that they have. And I understand you do this, you put forth hypotheses. You want to use the word hypotheses? You put forth hypotheses. But what's happened is we hold on to these hypotheses. We hold on to them, 
and we treat them as if they are facts. So that if there's a student in the class who disagrees or who has trouble with that, they're mocked. They're not just left alone, they are mocked. There are professionals who are at my level who are not put forth in certain societies and for certain awards because we cannot buy into those hypotheses because we don't see the evidence that's convincing for us. And the other thing that happens, and, and I'll tell you, th this, this is a real thing, is that you have a group of scientists here, and I've sat in their presence, and, and uh, uh, they will say, there's a hundred million people in this country that don't buy into evolution. What is wrong with the United States? There's a hundred million people that don't buy into it, and those are all the, the Trump supporters. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Maybe the hundred million people don't buy into it because you haven't convinced them. Could that be? Could that be that your hypothesis hasn't been convincing for them? But they speak condescendingly of a hundred million people. And I've heard it with my own ears, and I've confronted them on this. And there's people that have seen me confront them on this. And they don't buy into it because the evidence isn't there for them. They're not convinced. And what I've tried to show you is that theories that people love change over time. Conjectures. You want to call it a theory? Call it a conjecture. Hypotheses change over time. This is natural. So let's not hold on to them as facts and, and, and uh, blackball these people because they don't buy into it or speak of them as they're a bunch of idiots because they don't buy into it. That's the problem because it's the 100 million people who fund your research program. You sure you want to speak to them like that? They're the ones paying for this. And, and therein lies the problem, okay? I'm not upset with you. I just, I just get passionate sometimes. <laughs> Hi. Um, so throughout your talk, you commented a lot on how a prebiotic Earth doesn't have a brain. Um, so from a lot of what I've heard and my training in thermodynamics says it's not a brain problem, it's a probability problem. So I was just wondering if you done any numbers or like if you if you because there was the one number up there yeah. the like 10 yeah. to the 90 but yeah. oh yeah so so the numbers have been crunched over and over and over again mathematicians have gone through these numbers for decades the numbers are no way are we ever going to get life the numbers are so far against you i don't show the numbers because i'm coming with an argument that few people have come up with that few people have brought forth. There are some that have brought, but certainly not in the recent past. And so I'm showing you chemical arguments. The things that I talked about interactomes, interactomes are very new in people considering interactomes, the non-covalent interactions. So then I showed the probability of the numbers against that, but I was showing it in the context of a chemical argument. So I've stuck just with the chemical arguments. If you want to stick with the numbers argument, uh, there, there's no way within the, the time of the, uh, of, of the entire universe. So in other words, I wrote about this in my recent article, which is entitled Time Out, that came out in the journal Inference. And, and, uh, and I quote uh, researchers that were saying, because of the difficulty with the numbers, that there's no time in the entire universe for any of this to have happened. Not just by a little bit, but by a huge amount. So what does the author do? He grabs hold of an infinite number of universes. And so when you have an infinite number of universes, you're talking about infinity, then one could happen. So he, 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 he confessed that there's, the universe doesn't give enough time, so we're just going to have to go to an infinite number of universes. And that's, that's, that's just hard for people to buy. It's just hard. Thank you. I have a question. Just small. No, one. you you run Rashio Christie. I mean, oh questions. come on, You're just one. Hard. So, uh, what about the word chance? The way people use it in today's lingo, like saying, "Give it enough chance." Ch they use chance all the time. Yeah. Is chance yeah, really yeah. a cause? Can you address that? I know it sounds so basic. You, you, Could you address you, you, it? You sound like you have the answer to this. I this I may I may question. not, but I just want but, you to address yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, it's thrown I, around I, everywhere. I, I tried to address this with time. 
So people will say, given enough time, this will happen. It's a bunch of baloney. Because the parts decompose. Remember the parts rust? They decompose. And, they, and the very chemical conditions that make the reactions decompose those very products. And so time is the enemy. And as soon as you make that, you got to have the next thing with it that it can react with very quickly. Because, and people say, well, early Earth wasn't like Earth today. It didn't have as much oxygen. That's true. Well, that's at least the conjecture. So they'll say it had ammonia. Ammonia is much harsher than is O2. Ammonia is a strong base. Ammonia will take any carbonyl compound and make, make a bunch of imines out of it. And uh, um, so, so it, it, it can be very harsh. It would pluck off protons. So you, you think of an early Earth, and the time argument goes away. I mean, time doesn't help you. And the numbers, that, that number of chance, the arguments for this have gotten so not in favor of life ever forming because the mathematicians have crunched these numbers since the early 60s, actually. The numbers have been crunched. That, that uh, uh, you have to now grasp for infinite number of universes. Because once you choose infinity, then all other numbers are small. All right, any other questions? Anybody? Oh, look, right here. Thank you so much for coming out, Dr. Tu. Um, question, you talked about sin and what sin means um, in terms of the Bible. Yeah. Is there a scientific explanation uh, on biological molecular level what it can be and its connection to East and cleansing of the East in Old Testament? Yeah, so I, I don't know of a molecular definition of sin and how that relates, but I will tell you from experience that sin destroys lives. I have so many data points on this because, because I don't ha I'm not a prophet, but I can look at a student and look at their behavior and tell you what their life is going to be like unless they change what their life is going to be like. I see young guys think they have the world by the tail, and I can see their behavior and their actions, and I know that when I see them in a decade or two decades, their life is going to be miserable. So I see what sin brings into people's lives. And this is purely by observation. I've worked, I, I went to the university at the age of 18 and I never left. And so I have a whole lot of data points on this. And I see what living according to the scriptures. It says in John chapter 7, verse 17, when, when they were probing Jesus, how do we know what you say is true? Jesus said, if anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is from God or whether I speak from myself. It's as we do the will of God that we understand the perfection of it. That's why I never try to take the unbeliever and convince them in the, about the flood or about Adam and Eve or about crossing of the Red Sea. It's the resurrection. That's what the scripture says is the barrier. It's the resurrection. And that's the thing that's been placed on the heart of men and women that they can go away with and believe because it's already there. When it comes to the Bible as a whole, you can't expect a brand new believer to say, you know, say this is the word of God. It did. You get this exactly as Jesus said, when you're willing to do his will, when you follow the precepts that are here, you see the results of it. You see the results of it in people's lives, your own life and every life around you. And that's when you learn that this book is true. All right, anybody else? I think we're about wrapped up here. All right, one more. This is uh, probably more scientific. Um, can you uh, respond to those that would say those big leaps in evolution are due to uh, horizontal gene transfer acted upon by neutral selection in small population sizes? Yeah. No, I, I can't comment on that. I, I don't cool. know enough to comment on that. I have, I have friends who are geneticists who could comment on that. But um, uh, no, I can't. I, I, I can't. I, I don't know how that. How that uh, I don't know how to do that. All right, cool. Thanks. Okay. 
Anybody else? Going one, two, three. All right, well, okay, this is definitely the last question. I meant to say last one. Sorry. I have one question. Uh, is God just? And justice exists in the yeah. world. Certainly the Bible says he is. God is, God, God is a just God, and he's an all-knowing God. And, uh, and so when he's all-knowing, and he loves to the extent that he does love, I could never call him unjust. I mean, if I, if I were running this world, I, I would do it very differently and, and a lot, with a lot less justice than he does it. So I know what the scriptures say about him, and I've come to know him and to love him, and I trust him. I trust him. Okay, so if a human being lives in an island yeah. without any connection to Jesus or right. whoever, yeah. so that basically denies the justice of God. So there, you didn't put any way for me to get to the truth or whatever. Yeah, do, so do you live in an island all alone? Is that where you live? No. All right, so I did give you a way, and you yeah. do have a way. For the man or the woman who is on the island all alone, first of all, it's interesting how they ever got to that island without ever getting, seeing any other people. But if they were, my God is a just God. He would deal with them according to his mercy and his goodness. My God would be a just God. You, sir, need to deal with this for yourself. You throw out these hypotheticals, and Jesus comes to you, and he's touching your heart. He is the one that is touching your heart. And I pray that you have a vision of Jesus coming to you. And that shows you that indeed God is, and he is kind and gracious as he comes to you in this vision. Because I know you believe in visions. I know you do. And he will come to you. I believe in all prophets. God. They're great men. But uh, being Jesus, the, the only truth is, I think it's not true. All right, well, well, may Jesus come to you and show, show you his way. And I pray that when he comes to you, your heart will be open, sir. Well, if I live in Amazon, he never can come Do you live there. in Amazon? Yeah. I, I don't know why, like, why we, you keep going We can going assume that. You don't, you, you know, that's you know, you the live chance right here. of uh, being in Amazon. All right, when, you, when like, you're in uh, the Amazon, we'll speak differently. But now that you live in Columbus, Ohio, let's deal with you right here, sir. Right, this is a fact, like... Uh, you put some numbers up there and uh, scientifically, and uh, there is a little chance to get struck by uh, like thunderstock. So it's like one per million. But there are people that got struck by the thunderstock like three times. It's like almost zero, but it happens. You know, just uh, there is yeah, a there is a chance I've, for I've me to be uh, born in Amazon. You know, and I have no idea how to get to a uh, land that even Jesus like reached there, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear what you're saying. And God is a just God, and he'll sort it out. I trust well, him. That's not a scientific way I to trust prove him. it. Thank you. Yeah, that's not scientific. You're not giving me anything scientific. I mean, so, you, you know, I'm just speaking based on the faith that I have. All right, well, why don't we uh, give Dr. Tor a uh, warm applause. Thank Just thank you so much, and uh, we appreciate everybody coming out. And uh, we're, we have a table out in the back if you want to find out more about us. But have a great night, and thanks for coming. <laughs>